optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I answer your personal question? Now it is in the perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over metal endoskeleton. Lee, Tim, Paris, so. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront, and this is a very unique sponsor. Wealthfront is a massively disruptive, in a good way, set it and forget it investing service led by technologists from places like Apple and world famous investors. It has exploded in popularity in the last two years, and they now have more than two and a half billion dollars under management. In fact, some of my very good friends, investors in Silicon Valley, have millions of their own money in Wealthfront. So the question is why? Why is it so popular? Why is it unique? Because you can get services previously reserved for the ultra wealthy, but only pay pennies on the dollar for them. And this is because they use smarter software instead of retail locations, bloated sales teams, etc. And I'll come back to that in a second. I suggest you check out wealthfront.com forward slash Tim, take the risk assessment quiz, which only takes two to five minutes, and they'll show you for free exactly the portfolio they'd put you in. And if you just want to take their advice, run with it, do it yourself, you can do that. Or as I would, you can set it and forget it. And here's why. The value of Wealthfront is in the automation of habits and strategies that investors should be using on a regular basis, but normally aren't. Great investing is a marathon, not a sprint, and little things that you may or may not be familiar with, like automatic tax loss harvesting, rebalancing your portfolio across more than 10 asset classes, and dividend reinvestment add up to very large amounts of money over longer periods of time. Wealthfront, as I mentioned, since it's using software instead of retail locations, etc., can offer all of this at low costs that were previously completely impossible. Right off the bat, you never pay commissions or account fees. For everything, they charge 0.25% per year on assets above the first 15000 which is managed for free if you use my link, wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. That is less than $5 a month to invest a $30,000 account, for instance. Now, normally, when I have a sponsor on this show, it's because I use them and recommend them. In this case, it's a little different. I don't use Wealthfront yet because I'm not allowed to. Here's the deal. They wanted to sponsor this podcast, but because of SEC regulations, companies that invest your money are not allowed to use client testimonials. So I couldn't be a user and have them on the podcast. But I've been so impressed by Wealthfront that I've invested a significant amount of my own money, at least for me. Uh, in the team and the company itself. So I am an investor and hope to soon use it as a client. Now back to the recommendation. As a Tim Ferriss Show listener, you'll get $15,000 managed for free if you decide to open an account. But just start with seeing the portfolio that they would suggest for you. Take two minutes, fill out their questionnaire at wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. It's fast, it's free. There's no downside that I can think of. Just take a look, see what portfolio they would create for you, and you can use that information however you want. Wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by 99designs. When your business needs a logo, website, business card, thumbnail, or any other design, I recommend checking out 99designs. I use them myself. I've used them for many years. I use them to create book cover prototypes for the 4-Hour Body, which went on to become a number one New York Times bestseller. I've also used them for banner ads, illustrations, and much more. With 99designs, you get a variety of original designs from designers around the world, give your feedback, and then pick your favorite. Your happiness is guaranteed. So check out some of my competitions and designs and some of your competitions and designs from fellow Tim Ferriss Show listeners at 99designs.com forward slash Tim. And right now, you can get a free $99 upgrade on your first design. So check it out, 99designs.com forward slash Tim. Hello, boys and girls. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where each episode, it is my job to deconstruct world-class performers, to tease out the habits, routines, favorite books, serials, whatever it might be, that you can test and apply in your own life. And this episode is an interview you've been asking for since before I started the podcast, Morgan Spurlock. He would also have been on my top 10 dream list when I was drafting up potential guests for this podcast in the very beginning. Morgan Spurlock, at Morgan Spurlock on Twitter, is an Oscar-nominated documentary filmmaker based in New York, which is where we did this interview, in his office. He is a prolific writer, director, producer, and human guinea pig. His first film, which many of you will know, Super Size Me, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2004, winning Best Directing Honors. 
The film went on to win the Writers Guild of America Best Documentary Screenplay, as well as garner an Academy Award nomination for Best Feature Documentary. Since then, he has directed, produced, and distributed a ton, multiple film, TV, and digital projects, including some that I love, arguably even more than Super Size Me, and I enjoyed that movie a ton, including the CNN series Morgan Spurlock Inside Man, the FX series 30 Days, and the films Where in the World is Osama Bin Laden, Confessions of a Superhero, Freakonomics, The Greatest Movie Ever Sold, which you talk about quite a bit in this podcast, and many, many others. Morgan's latest project is a tech startup called Collect, C-L-E-C-T dot com. Check it out. C-L-E-C-T, like Collect, C-L-E-C-T dot com, which is a community for high-spending collectors with a one-stop marketplace where people can browse, sell, and buy collectibles of any type imaginable. And for a nerd like me, this is just heaven. Star Wars, Smurfs, comics, a Millennium Falcon made from motorcycle parts is one actual real example. If you go to the website, you can see that. Imagine Comic-Con meets Pinterest and eBay with a lot more thrown into the mix. And as someone who owns 10,000 poly-bagged, cardboard-backed comic books at home, yes, I am a dork. In this episode, we cover a ton. And I want to ask Morgan many of these questions for years. We talk about how Morgan got his biggest breaks and in some cases made his own luck. We talk about tips for aspiring creators and filmmakers, how to get people to care about important issues. That is a very tough needle to thread. Favorite books, documentaries, movies, etc. Morgan's thoughts on the future of media and storytelling and much, much more. Before I recorded this episode, I threw up on Facebook and Twitter a request for questions for Morgan. And there were two links that popped up a couple of times that I wanted to address because it underscores a scientific literacy problem that I want to highlight. So everyone listening, if you haven't read Bad Science by Ben Goldacre or The Appendices, which are an excerpt from that in The 4-Hour Body, you should read these. Uh, Because a number of folks asked, well, why uh, are there particular articles that have trouble replicating the results that Morgan had in Super Size Me? The first one, which is related to a teacher who lost 61 pounds using caloric restriction, but with junk food losing weight, does not apply. It is fundamentally completely a different protocol. So that you can just dismiss out of hand. And then the second one was related to a study by Frederick Nystrom, in Sweden. And the article that was most often cited was actually preliminary data. And the preliminary data, as it turns out, just like with split testing, ended up getting flipped in a lot of ways when it got to the final results, which I tracked down. And ultimately, the results are as follows. And this is from SkylarTanner.com. But uh, it is a reprint, effectively. Others suffered almost as much as Spurlock, with one volunteer taking barely two weeks to reach the maximum 15% weight gain allowed by the ethics committee that had approved the study. And it goes on to say that these results are highly individualized. And this was a study that allowed exercise. And I should highlight that is not what Morgan did. So again, you need to be basically scientifically literate to assess when the media spins studies to serve their own interests in the form of a headline very often. So I feel very comfortable supersize me at this point. And there are some people who said it's impossible to eat 5,000 calories a day. I would beg to differ. You can eat a lot more than that on a daily basis. You can read the four hour body for more on that. With all of that said, please enjoy my wide ranging conversation with Morgan Spurlock. Morgan, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to be in your offices finally. I know we've had a couple of lunches, a couple yeah. of dinners over time, yeah. and it's nice to see the operation. And I thought, you know, we were talking just before we started recording about breakfast, and you said, well, I don't usually have breakfast, but if it's a breakfast meeting, I can't be the guy sitting there kind of judging the other person. That's right. Do you get that a lot after Super Size Me well, or What happens more than anything, whenever I'm at a restaurant, people will walk by and they'll look at what I'm eating. <laughs> And sometimes they'll comment, and so they'll look at what I'm eating, and they'll and you know so sometimes they'll see what what's on my plate, and then other times they'll walk by and be like, <laughs> better than McDonald's, right? You know, so I'll get and I'm like, it's been 12 years, like that. I'm gonna be that is my I'm married to that forever. It's, it's your thing, yeah. It's my thing. I'm I'm, all, I'm okay with that. I was at the Russian baths yesterday here. Just about to pull off the underwear, yeah. and uh, there were two fans who walked up, and they're like, hey, trying to get four hours worth of sauna in 15 minutes? And I was like, yep, I kind of deserve that, I guess. I'll be the four-hour guy indefinitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when somebody asks you, what do you do, how do you answer that? Um, I say I'm a storyteller. That's what I am. 
Um, I'm a professional storyteller. Where did that first start in terms of being bitten by the bug? Was there a particular experience or mentor who steered you in that direction? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, my mom was probably the biggest one. When I look back as a kid, um, like I loved comic books. I started drawing and writing my own comic books when I was really young, um, just in a notebook like this. Like I would make the squares, draw the blocks in, make, you know, draw all the characters, tell the stories. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that was when I was like maybe eight or nine years old. My mom was really encouraging of that. So I think she was probably the first one. And then at the same time, they were, you know, it was the seventies. So the parents took you to see things you should never take kids to see in movie theaters. You know, we, we didn't wear helmets on bikes. We didn't wear seatbelts in cars. You packed 10 kids into the back of the Cutlass and took them to baseball, Cutlass and took them to baseball practice. But like, so my parents would take me to see movies like Jaws, The Exorcist, things you would never take a kid to see today. It's just, it's just wrong in so many levels. But, um, so they would take me to see these movies, but these were the movies that made me want to make movies. Like I loved horror films. And so like the movie Scanners, like when that guy's head exploded in Scanners, that was the moment where I said, I have to do that, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. Now, what was it about the head explosion? Was it just the shock value, the ability to grab someone's attention, and just the way that it looked? Like the because when I was a kid, I originally wanted to be Rick Baker. I wanted to be Tom Savini. Like when I saw American Werewolf in London, I mean, it blew my mind. That's what, a great movie. It's a great movie, and what the effects did then, and these were all practical effects from his hand growing to his snout growing. Um, there was no CGI. It was all there was all things that somebody made and created and figured out how to do. So. That was kind of the bug that I had first. It was kind of wanting to be in that side of it. And then once I learned you could actually go to college and learn how to make movies and you know direct movies and produce movies, I said, well, that's the path I want to go on. And so you went to you attended film school? I went to, I went to film school first at, at U.S. I tried to get into USC's film school, and I applied. I got into their broadcast journalism school. This was like in 1989. And so I said, well, I'll go to USC. I'll go there because like, if you're going to make movies, you've got to go to California. You've got to go to Hollywood. And I grew up in West Virginia, and so Hollywood was a million miles away. Good from wrestling me. state. Good wrestling state. <laughs> great state for wrestling um even especially when they're not family members but um the, so i went so i went to hollywood because i said this is where i have to be and so every semester i would apply to film school at usc and every semester i would re- get rejected from film school at usc i applied five times i still have all the rejection letters i keep them all i kept them all um and so finally the fifth time i was like i can't keep putting all my eggs in like this usc basket and i was so stupid at the time like i wouldn't apply to ucla just out of principle which is so dumb <laughs> when you think about it but because in UCLA is in such a better part of town. Yeah, yeah. It's such a more beautiful campus. So you just adopted the rivalry as your I was told all, already. Like, I was a Trojan through and through. I was like, I'm not going to go to UCLA. I'm not going to even apply to their film school. So I applied to NYU, and I got into NYU. And so I moved to New York. And New York is so much better for me as a person. I think I think it suits my personality much more, not to mention my skin tone, because <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm spectacularly pale. Yeah, we're, we're both on the pale end of yeah. the spectrum. How so, did it fit your personality? I, th- I think that I grew up in a, in a place and in a family and in a culture where you mean what you say and you say what you mean. And that's kind of how I was brought up. And I think that New York is very much a city that, you know, says what it says and means what it says and will tell you to your face, you know, it'll stab you right in the chest and tell you like you suck. And here's why. And this is what we don't like about you and what you do. Whereas in, uh, you know, Los Angeles, it's the inverse. Yeah, it is the inverse. And LA at least, well, I should say New York, rather. If it's about money, you know how to interact with someone. And if they're blunt, it might be abrasive, but at least it saves you time. And you know where you stand. You at least stand. I, know from the, I know from minute one where I stand yeah. with somebody in New York City. Whereas in LA, you talk to somebody, and the whole time they're talking to you, they're like looking over your shoulder to see who more important or more interesting <laughs> might be coming into the room. That's so disconcerting. Yeah. Like my first few trips to LA, I'm just like, what is happening right now? Well, like, where's, where's some, this, where's, this, is there somebody else here? What about, what about me? I'm, yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the experience in film school, Mm -hmm. what were the most important lessons that you learned in film school? Well, the cool thing was, I mean, at NYU, when I was at film school there, is it taught you the hustle. Like, the thing about NYU is you had to raise your own money for your movies. You had to to find, by hook or by crook, any way to make the film. So, I mean, that was, it was so realistic. I mean, it was a much more independent mindset, I think, of preparing you for life after film school. Whereas at USC, like, if you were in film school there, they paid for your movies. You're pampered a bit. Yeah, and they they own your movies. Like, so basically, USC pays for your films, then they own the films after. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, cause it's kind of part of their legacy. Like people who go through the directing program, we pay for the films, but now we own Ron Howard's movie, his student film forever. Um, so I think for me, it prepared me much more for what was coming next, which was the hustle, you know, what, mm-hmm. what you have to do when you get out. What was your first, uh, in your mind, major project after film school? Um, 
what was my first major project after film school? I mean, and by major, I mean in your own mind. In my mind, I tell you, that here's, well, there's there's an interesting thing that had happened to me after film school. So um, I got a job. My first job was being a PA on the professional, the Luc Besson film. And so it's a pretty sweet gig. It was a pretty sweet gig. And so here I was, I was 22, 23 what years a old. Film. Yeah. <laughs> and it was awesome. Like it was so exciting to get to be on this movie and kind of see him. And so I was kind of schlepping, you know, being a PA for the next three, two to three years working on any movie I could get on. So I was a PA on that movie. And then I was on, I worked on Woody Allen's bullets over Broadway and, um, Barbe Schroeder's kiss of death. And so it was on kiss of death where, um, I got offered a job. I got a friend of mine a job, a girl named Sarah Casper, who um, I went to film school with. She produced my senior thesis film. It's one of those things where you get out of film school, you finish your senior, senior thesis film. You're like, now I'm going to send this out to film festivals. This is going to win all kinds of awards. Hollywood's going to come calling. I'm going to get my big movie. And then none of that happens. <laughs> then nothing happens. <laughs> nothing happens. <laughs> you convince yourself that I'm going to finish this thing and everything's going to change and I'm going to get these big movie deals. And of course, none of that happens. You know, Probably to point oh 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 one one percent that happens to everybody else it doesn't. Um, and so I got out, you know, not, that didn't happen. So I was like just hustling through, you kind of inching my way up the ladder of, of production. And I got a friend of mine, a job on this movie in the casting department. She was w- working for a woman named Tracy Moore Marable, who I, I, to this day I look at as kind of one of my mentors because she changed my life completely by what happened next. Um, Sarah was casting for this job for someone to be the spokesperson for Sony electronics. She goes, so they, she goes, so yeah, she goes, I can send anybody in for this. You should go audition for this job. And I was like, I don't have an agent. She goes, I can send anyone. It doesn't matter. And so I, I went downtown to pick up film from set one day, dropped it off at Technicolor on my way back to the office. Um, I ran an audition for this thing. And two weeks later I found out I got the job. And so everybody in the office was like, oh my God, that's great. Congratulations. Here's a bag. See you later. Like everybody was so happy I was leaving. They're just like, they're like, good, get out. Peace out. Get out of this, get out of this movie. Um, and so for the next two and a half years, I traveled around the country working for Sony as like this carnival barker on stage. Like that went, so they went to trade shows, they went to sporting events, they went to colleges, you name it. And they were one of the sponsors of the Bud Light Pro Beach Volleyball League. Huh. So yeah, so it's so it sort of like Ron Pope heel origins, like selling Sony from the state. It's a big f- show. It was, this, it was this giant tour truck that when I first went on the road with it, it was all about Sony auto sound. Like Sony had launched this big car stereo division. So it was all about getting people. And I didn't have to know anything about the product. I just had to get people to come over. And so I would just like on this stage say, come on over, check this out, blah, blah, blah. And people would come up and tour the truck and look at everything. And then the next year it became Sony PlayStation. Then the next year it became Sony Vio when they launched their computers and while I'm on the road with them, my boss on this at the time, a guy named David Lax, said, we need to make a video about this tour and what we're doing. Um, who should we have do that? And I said, you should have me do that. I said, I went to film school. Let me make that. And so I made this film for them about this. And then I made a bigger film for Sony about Minidisc. And then I made a bigger film about something else for them. And then probably then my biggest project that I ever did with them was their kind of CES at the Consumer Electronics Show sure. in like 1990. Uh, it's like Burning Man for Nerds. Totally. It's like Burning Man for Nerds. It's exactly what it is. <laughs> like it's, it's super nerd prom. And so I made kind of their CES experience movie where you went into this theater and I mean, they spent millions of dollars on it and it was like the biggest thing I'd ever done. So the biggest thing I did out of film school, the bi- first biggest gigantic thing I did was that. Wow. And so, and it was so like off track of where I thought my career was going to be going or what I thought I'd be doing. But little did I know that all of those things that I was doing were ultimately putting me on a path for where I am now. So this is a sort of a theme that recurs a lot in these interviews with, say, for instance, Jamie Foxx, where these things that were seemingly unrelated to his end destination prepared yeah. him perfectly for it. Totally. And I was going to ask you uh, a little later in our conversation about how you build rapport with people. Yeah. But uh, let's dig into it right now. So what, sure. if, if I watch, say, Inside Man which I love, or, uh, you know, 30 days. Yeah. Uh, I'm consistently impressed with how you get people to embrace you from different worlds and accept yeah. you and trust you. How did you develop that? Or I mean, have you always been hardwired for that? Well, I think the biggest thing you have to do is, is you just have to listen. The minute you start listening, it's amazing how people will talk to you and how people will embrace you. We live in a culture where we don't listen to begin with. I think that's one. Um, and I think we also live in a culture and we live in a world where a lot of people aren't honest with each other and just don't kind of openly have conversations with you and, and talk about things that are hard to talk about or talk about things that may be um, difficult or, or hurtful um, or potentially hurtful. And I think that if you come into those types of moments, just I think um, – wanting to kind of wanting to understand 
and wanting to understand where somebody else is coming from. It doesn't have to be confrontational. It doesn't have to be ugly. Um, you can have a really honest, above-board conversation that is meaningful. And I think that's – so for me, I think that's the biggest thing is I, I, I think the, the best thing I do sometimes is, is shut up and listen. So if you had, let's just say, you were teaching – went back to NYU and you were giving a guest lecture to yeah. – would be documentarians right. <laughs> and somebody came up to you and they said, you know what? I just had this incredible opportunity. I'm actually going out this weekend to interview 10 people for my film for the first time. Yeah. I've never done this before. How do I get them to open up? Right. What would you say to them? Um, I would say first talk about things that they care about, you know, get them to talk about things that are meaningful to them in the beginning, uh, things that they like, things that they love. You don't want to go right in to like, so what's it like to have cancer? Right. You don't want that to be the first question. <laughs> right. out. You want to kind of work up to this because you want to, you want to have, it's, it's a relationship. You're building a relationship with someone over the course of a conversation mm -hmm. and you want to have them trust you. Um, and part of what you also want to do in that conversation is offer up things that are similar Mm -hmm. And kind of where they're coming from or experiences you've had that kind of put them in a, in a comparative level. And I think that then you kind of build up and build up and then you can start chipping away at the information you really want. Mm -hmm. But you need to take the time to build that that relationship, I think. The, uh, the, the providing of... See, that's me ruining the podcast right there with my no, phone. No, that's okay. This, that. is, this is uh, <laughs> this cinema <laughs> audio verite. The... Uh, the advice you just gave... I'm that gave. guy in the movie theater every day. <laughs> I am that guy. The advice you just gave about being, well, I'm paraphrasing here, but sure. being vulnerable yourself to yep. elicit vulnerability was also something that was underscored for me by a guy named Neil Strauss, who's an author, but wrote for Rolling Stone and New York Times did a lot of interviews. And it's incredible how that gear yeah. shifts the entire dynamic. Yeah. Uh, why Warrior Poets? Why Warrior Poets? That's, yeah, yeah, so that's the, the name of your company. This is the name of my company. And it came um, a few years ago by, I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due, there was a, a former assistant at the Gersh Agency who's now a full agent, a guy named Sean Barclay, who right after Super Size Me, I went out to LA to have, you know, it's like when you go out and they have the meetings, like we want you to meet all these people. The, the Death Star meetings? Yeah, like you have all the Death people. Star meetings. And so I'm being driven all around town, meeting with all the studios, meeting with all the folks. And so I, as I'm being driven around by then assistant Sean Barclay, um, he, we're just talking about you know you know what I want to do what I want my what I what 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 are we going to do next and by that point we'd already sold thirty days thirty days was already going to be the the thing we did after Super Size Me and so we're just talking about kind of the path that that I want to be on and the stories I want to tell and you know what's important to me and then I said I'm I want to I'm starting a new company I need a I need a new name because my old company this is this I'll, I'll to have a quick aside, my, my first company was a web company. So we started off in 2000 with a web company. The idea as the bubble was exploding and um, was I wanted to create a, a, a content company where we would create programming online and then springboard it off to film or television. So we created a company called the Interactive Consortium. Terrible name, a terrible name, but it's, but it's had interactive in the title, so it must have been something. And it was a consortium of talented people that came together to tell stories. And so there was, there was logic in my mind, just, but the name was terrible. But we called ourselves The Con for short, because we called ourselves The Consortium, which, and it was The Con. If you look at Super Size Me at the beginning, it says The Con. That's the title at the beginning, which I thought was a great name for a company, not when you're trying to raise money. It's not a good name for a company. It's not a good When you're, when you're chasing financiers, you don't want to be called The, the Con. con. Um, J.D. Salinger and Associates. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And JT so, Marlin and Associates. And so this was so that was the uh, so that was the previous name of the company. I said I want to start a new company. Um, and, and so he said, well, what about warrior poets? And, and I said, as a, as a big Braveheart fan and as a Scotsman, I said, what, because of, because I'm Scottish and because of Braveheart. And he goes, has, he goes, warrior poets has nothing to do with Braveheart. And he goes, that's a, that is a, a phrase that was stolen by, by Mel Gibson for the movie. He goes, warrior poets were around throughout history. Like these were people who, um, who were poets or who were musicians or who were, who were people who entertained the masses with their wit and their, and their, and their writings, their music, but when time came to fight for what they believed in, they would lay down their instruments and pick up swords or pick up or pick up whatever they had to go fight for spears to go fight for what they believed in to fight for their country. And I was like, I said, that's exactly what we are. I said, we are warrior poets. Yes, that's the name. And so that's where it came from. And how do you choose your project should be more specific? How did you decide to do 30 days after Super Size Me? Right? Because I mean, bam, suddenly yeah. the iron, you know, the, the, the iron's hot. Yeah. And this, and this was before, so we got the idea for 30 days before Super Size Me was even finished. So we were in post on the movie, um, 
we said, I, I said, I decided we had just submitted the movie to Sundance. So we hadn't even gotten into Sundance yet. We just submitted the film and I said, we should have a test screening of the movie just so we see what's happening. And cause that's what you did. You had test screenings. The studios all did it. I said, we should do what they do to be successful. We should do that. So we got clipboards because clipboards make you look 30% more official. And we <laughs> stood outside of the Angelica right up the street on the corner of house and Broadway. And we said, excuse me, as people were coming out of the movies, we're like, would you like to come to the test screening of a new independent documentary? And people are like, Oh yes, I would. That would be great. And so we signed up like 50 people who came over to the gold Crest screening room on the west side and it was myself and my two editors um julie bob and stella went over to the screening and the 50 people watched the movie and then after the film this one woman stood we came down front and we said anybody have any questions or anything and this one woman said i just want to say thank you thank you for making this movie and showing the world finally how terrible these corporations are that they're screwing us and they're killing us and then a guy on the other side of the room was like hold on what, what movie did you watch he's like what are you you out of your mind he goes that's, that's not what this movie's about at all and so they start you're crazy you're crazy you're crazy you're crazy so they're yelling at one another and I just lean over to, lean over to the, the, my editors and I'm like this is awesome <laughs> this, is, this is amazing this is gonna be huge this is incredible <laughs> but, it, but it elicited this like awesome visceral reaction in people yeah. like it really struck a chord and so the next day when we were back in the edit room i said how do we do that every every day how do we do that every week like how do we mm. transition this into something because the film and the film was fast like i got the idea for the film on thanksgiving of 2002 and a year and a day later the day after thanksgiving 2003 i got the phone call that we got into sundance so i mean it was fast wow like, that's the, really fast. it's really fast for a doc it's super fast like from from idea to like delivery in the film festival what happened on thanksgiving that triggered this idea. I was sitting I was sitting on my mom's couch in a spectacular trip to Fan Hayes when a news story came on about these two girls that were suing McDonald's. Um, and so these girls said, We're fat, we're sick, and it's your fault. And I was like, Well that come on, that's crazy. Said so, like you're gonna sue somebody for, you know, selling you food that you bought that you ate and then blame them for it. I said, How can you do that? And then a spokesperson from McDonald's came on and said, You can't link our food to these girls being sick. You can't link our food to these girls being obese. Our food is healthy, it's nutritious, it's good for you. And I was like, well, I don't know if you can say that either. <laughs> and I said, Because if it's that good for me, then shouldn't I be able to eat it for I don't know, 30 days straight with no side effects? And I was like, Oh, there it that's is. it. That's it. And so that was the, that was the that was the moment. And then yeah, so then a year later we got into the festival and and so as we were in the edit I said how do we do that? How do we do that on a regular basis? And we said let's make it a series. Let's make it a series where and, and the original idea was it was going to be me in every episode kind of putting myself into these situations at which point my girlfriend said you're not going to have a girlfriend very long because <laughs> because it's basically then I'm gone for 6 months at a time when we do that sh- 6 episodes of that show. Um, but as soon as the movie exploded at Sundance and we sold it, I was on a plane to LA. And we sold that. We pitched that show and sold it to FX the next week. So it was a week after Sundance. We'd already sold that. So the movie wasn't even in theaters, and we'd set up that show. And in thirty days, were, were there any particular shows or proposals that you yeah. weren't able to make? Whether with that or Inside Man, was there no, anything that got vetoed? There was there, the only thing that ever got vetoed is when we were doing the immigration episode. I wanted to have great episode, by the way. Thanks. No, I, lo- I mean I'm really proud of that it's show. Really for strong me, episode. And for me, the best episodes of that show are the shows that I'm not in. Like I understand why everybody's like, no, the ones that you're in are the best. But it's like, but that's for me, that's not the best because the best proof of that show is people who have to defend their beliefs. And when somebody has to get in there, and, and basically to people that disagree with them or contradict them to say, here's what I believe and why, and to have the courage to you know, continue to one, have those beliefs be questioned and also be open to kind of seeing the world in a different way takes a tremendous amount of, of, of courage. So, I mean, I think that's the, I, I love those episodes, but the immigration episode, when we first came up with that, um, I wanted to go across the border and have a coyote bring me over. I said, I want to go to Mexico. And I said, and I want to come over with a bunch of illegal immigrants and who are basically sneaking into the country with a coyote and show how it's done. And big FX lawyer said no. And then I said, well, come on. I said, and then FX said, well, let's talk to the Fox lawyer. So then they went to the next person above now, them. The coyote then, being the term for someone who facilitates. That's right. So yeah, so the, yeah, the coyotes are the guys who bring you across over the border illegally. And so then I went to big Fox's attorney and big Fox's attorney was like, absolutely not. And so <laughs> that was the only thing that, uh, that I really wanted to do for the show that we wouldn't because they basically said if I if I and I did if I did it against their will and I just because I said why don't why don't we just do it we'll just go shoot it and we could put it in the show and they're like if you do that then you know they they basically threatened to like cancel the show and and take us off the air and not insure us and so I said all right we won't do that and you're like oh and they're like if you hadn't asked us that's then right, we'd have exactly. plausible deniability that's but exactly right. now you've gone and screwed both now, of us now you've gone and brought it up <laughs> yeah so now it's uh, I'm a real believer in that it's better to beg forgiveness than ask for permission these days yeah <laughs> what uh, 
for someone who's unfamiliar with your work, yeah. if you had to choose, say, two or three films or television episodes that yeah. you would, if you could make mandatory viewing for all Americans, what would they be? Um, let's think. I mean, it supersized me. I feel like everybody's seen. So I feel like everybody, I'm, I'm stopped yeah. by people all the time who've seen that, which is still mind blowing to me. Um, but I think, um, in 30 days, I love the, uh, the prison episode of 30 days, I think is a great episode. People should watch. Um, especially as we live in a country where we're still sending people to prison and we've turned prisons into profit. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great episode to watch and it will make you so angry. So I think that's that's one. Um, I love Greatest Movie Ever Sold. I think Greatest Movie Ever Sold and just the conceit of that film is spectacular. For people who haven't seen it, I'll just give you the quick rundown. It's a movie about product placement marketing and advertising where the whole film is paid for and made possible by product placement marketing and advertising. <laughs> it's, very, and it's very meta. It's spectacularly meta. It's so good. Um, Main and Tail, one of my favorite sponsors of all time, is a sponsor of that movie. And for those of you who don't know what Main and Tail is, Main and Tail is a magical shampoo that is for both horses and people. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, which I which I also love. I love because because you know how many times have we all been there where we're in the shower with our horse <laughs> and and we say why? Yeah, why do I need two products? Why for are, why is there just not one shampoo for both of us? Why is that? It's amazing. I'll tell you I'll tell you a quick story, which is my favorite things when we were making that movie. Because when I saw this, I found it, and you see, you see in the film when I find this in a store. Like I had no idea this existed, and I find this product, and I'm like, it is one of the greatest days of my life that I have found this product. And I'm, and you read the label, and it gives you like the instructions on the back of a bottle of Maine and Tail are amazing, like as it tells you how to use it to wash your horse. It's, it's ridiculous, and so I keep, so I start calling Devin Katza, Devin who is now a, a very good friend, and he's the pre- president of the company. So I'm like calling him, I'm stalking him, trying to get him to return my call to be in the movie to be in the movie and finally he calls me back and he says um he goes so so just tell me what is this movie about anyway so i explained him what the movie is and he goes so so how would you see us in the movie like how would we because we don't pay to be in movies you know we don't do that you know so so how would you see it and i said okay well here's here's how it is so now picture this so it's a close-up on a bottle of mane and tail and the camera slowly starts to pull back and as the camera pulls back you see me washing my little boy's hair then the camera pulls back a little bit more. And then you see me, and we're in a bathtub, and you see me washing my hair in the bathtub. And then the camera pulls back a little bit more, and it pulls back more, and then you see me turn to my left, and I'm washing my Shetland pony. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy goes, and then the phone is silent for a minute. And then he goes, that's the greatest integration I've ever heard in my life. That's amazing. He goes, oh, that's fantastic. Oh, for a minute there, I thought you were going to do something weird with the product. <laughs> <laughs> but then he goes on to tell me. He goes on to tell me because apparently it was in the Will Ferrell movie Blades of Glory. And yeah. he said, he goes, so, so I said to Will, I said, listen, I just want to make sure, like, you're not going to do anything like masturbate with it, are you? <laughs> I was like, I love that that's where he draws the line of what's weird. So like Will Ferrell masturbating with mane and tail in Blades of Glory would be weird. Me in the bathtub with a horse, totally fine. <laughs> totally fine. Oh my God. Yeah, it's amazing. It's so wait, so, so back to the original thing. So there's yeah. that movie. Um, Inside Man, there's so many episodes of Inside Man that I love. The season one of Inside Man, we do an episode about elder care. And this is on Netflix. All three seasons of Inside Man are on Netflix. All three seasons of, in, of 30 Days are on Netflix. Um, season one of Inside Man, we do an episode about uh, about elder care where I move in with my grandmother, and it is it for me. It's one of the most raw, honest, and powerful things I've ever made. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, uh, the the marijuana episode also it's super such, super strong. Such a good show, and it's like that guy Steve D'Angelo and what they're doing up at Harborside Medical in in Oakland is phenomenal. Like, because you go there, you have these visions of what dispensaries are going to be, and everybody thinks they're like dodgy and shady, and it's going to bring crime to the neighborhoods. And this place is beautiful. It looks like a health clinic. You walk, and they run it like a health clinic. They have they have uh, health instructors who are there. They have Reiki instructors. They have psychiatrists that you can meet with. Not to mention all the product that you can buy there. I mean, and it's run like a proper clinic, and it's phenomenal. Like. Like that's how every clinic in America should be. Like every dispensary should be. When did you go? Just since we're talking about health, yeah. I think it was Inside Man uh, when you went to Thailand, yes. Bumrungrad, Bumrungrad, yeah, Bumrungrad in, in in Thailand, which is an incredible facility. It's uh, phenomenal. It, would you ever? Why or why not? Would you go to Bumrungrad for medical? 
treatment yourself? I mean, I would, I would go back after being there. I had such a great experience and depending on what I had to have done, like if I had to have surgery that had real serious recuperation where I was going to be laid up for like weeks going there and having the surgery done and then knowing that I'm going to, uh, be on a beach for like the next four weeks in a place that's going to cost me a fraction, um, I think is worth it. And, uh, and I've spoken to people who since that episode have gone there for medical procedures, um, just because they saw that show and they're like, it's half of what it was going to cost me in the States, um, or less, you know, it's, it's remarkable. Yeah. Particularly, I mean, uh, if you're doing say an elective surgery or something that doesn't have, you're not having a brain tumor treated necessarily or might not be covered or it might not be covered. Exactly. I mean, I went to Nicaragua at one point, this is when I was writing the four hour body and realized, wait a second, if I just do say my, my full panel of blood testing yeah. at what is considered sort of the highest end, and I don't necessarily recommend Nicaragua for everybody, but uh, while I'm there on vac- vacation, it will pay for my vacation. Yeah, that's <laughs> which right. was incredible. That's right. And not only that, but they did uh, stat, which means for people who aren't familiar, you get your results back in 24 hours. So it was like literally turned around everything in the hospital yeah. in, in four or five hours. It was yeah. just phenomenal. Well, that's what I love. When I was at Bummer and Grad, you'd get a blood test. Everything's in one building. So you'd get a test done downstairs, and then I'd go upstairs to see my next doctor. And whether it was an MRI or a blood test or other, other panels they were doing in your, of your blood test. I'd get it done downstairs. And by the time I got upstairs, the doctor already had all the results. Like in real time, they were getting the results done because they also processed the blood in the hospital. So it wasn't being sent out to a lab like they do here in the States. You didn't go down to the, what are those lab clinics that you always end up going to that are all pop-ups? Oh, uh, like lab corp. Lab corp. Yeah. You, you go to like a lab corp where it's like a guy in like a basement with like, oh, a, well, you feel like you're going to a methadone clinic. Yeah, totally. it's, it's rough. So, so dodgy, but it's like everything, everything in one place and you and part of the reason they said why we can do it so cheaply is because everything's under one roof. We're not kind of third partying anything. And it's like, and I'm there and I'm like, why can't we just do more of that here? Why can't yeah. that just happen here? <sighs> Medical tourism. That's, yeah. I feel like I should, I should, uh, well, people can watch the episode. Can people can watch that episode? Yeah, they can watch it. It's, uh, it's, uh, season three of Inside Man. On Bum Run Grad, B U M R U N G R A D. Correct. And uh, people will be very, very impressed. It's, it's, it looks it's like four n- seasons. Not at all. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. not what you would expect at all. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that came quite a bit from my fans was yeah. how do you get people to care about important issues in an environment where there's such a deluge, yeah. such a barrage of noise? Yeah. How do you accomplish that? Yeah, that's a great question because it's like every day we feel like, are we doing anything that actually, are people paying attention? You know, you, you hope that you make things that will make a difference or that people will listen to or will at least create some level of empathy and, and change a viewpoint for someone. And I think that, I think the hardest thing is one, getting people just to watch. So I think once you get them to watch, I think that the, the way that I hope people get affected is because when we tell these stories, I get affected by them. Um, once you get immersed in them, and I mean, you know this better than anyone, is once you kind of get into these worlds and see it, part, it's a part of you forever. Like that becomes a part of your life. And whether it's me going to a foreign country for medical tourism or, um, you know, me was I was doing in, in, in this past season where I'm just like eliminating toxins from my house, all these like poisons and cleaning products and stuff that we use every day that we just don't even realize. Um, I think that, uh, I think for me, it's it's taking people on this vicarious journey with me. And so long as I am open and honest with you, then you're willing to pay attention. And I think that's a big one. Um, a friend of mine a few years ago gave some gave me some good advice where he said uh, he said you can't be afraid to show your scars. He goes that's 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 what you, that's who you are. And he goes and you can't you have to continue to stay true to that. And I think that's it was some of the best advice I ever got. What would you consider some of your scars? I think it's just being open and honest about your life. I think it's, you know, talking about the fact that, you know, I'm divorced, talking about the fact that, you know, I, uh, um, you know, kind of what led to that and, and, and being open and honest about your life and the things you've experienced and not being afraid to talk about that, you know, your upbringing and how that affected you. I think the more you can have those, the, that, that honesty in those relationships that you build with people, that creates a trust and it creates a trust not only with the people who watch the show, but with the people that you're talking to. If you are looking at a particular idea yeah. that you want to put forth in the world or explore, and it could be adapted to documentary format or television format, what are the factors that lead you to choose one or the other? You mean whether it's movie or TV? That's right. I, th- I think it's about, I think it's, it's can it sustain one? Because there's some movies that are meant to be, or some ideas that are meant to be movies. And there's, 
and you see this a lot of time when you watch documentaries, when 45 minutes in, you're like, this should be done now. As, but, but everybody wants to make a feature movie. Like, no, no, I'm going to make it a feature. And it's like, no, this should have been about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, 50 minutes. But they end up making it 75, 80. And that last 30, you're just like, oh, it's just trudging along and it should have been over. So for us, we avoid that by never kind of putting ourselves there. And so we say this is, this, there's things that are meant to be 90 minutes because they're big, big, deep explorations. But especially now, there's other ones that you can take to TV and I can have an even deeper exploration if I can do two to three episodes on it. There are four episodes on it um, that are hour long. And then you can have a, a real deep dive into these topics. Um, I think that... Uh, so for us, I mean, this, that's why it's great. Like I love being a storyteller right now. I love being a content creator, being a filmmaker, a director, whatever you want to call it, because there are places now to tell all these stories, whether it's 90 minutes or 30 minutes or 20 minutes or 10 minutes or three minutes. Like we made an amazing bunch of movies, um, a few years ago, uh, called focus forward um, that GE paid for where we basically made these three minute short films that were all about pe- innovators around the world, people who are doing incredible things. Um, and each one of these movies were three minutes long and they're powerful. They're, they're so beautiful and, and inspiring. And now like they've seen, like they've been seen by like a hundred million people around the world because it's one of those where anybody will give you a round of boxing. Like anybody will give you three minutes. And once you watch one, then you watch two, you watch three. What we saw is whoever, if you, if you made it through one, then you watched five. The average was five, which is awesome. So going back to the the guest lecture uh, yeah. at uh, NYU, yeah. So I'm kind of the they're going to be calling me soon now. Now oh, I know, I know, and I'm saying, is... hey, uh, we heard the lecture, uh, <laughs> we heard the podcast, and Tim's right. You should come to a guest lecture. Just incepting <laughs> exactly. the administration at NYU, <laughs> and so you have all these bright eyed, bushy tailed students yeah. who are say fixated on the feature film mm-hmm. documentary, and they say, I know you say that we have, we should, we could do these short things, but you know, I'm really, really obsessed with this idea of doing a feature. Sure. Uh, what, ca- what warnings or advice would you give them? And I just want to repeat one thing that, that you mentioned before we got started. We were looking at my, the audio equipment that I have here, which is very simple. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a Zoom H6 which it, with XLR cables that plug into... Simple is good. Yes, simple good. SM58 Shure mics. And we were talking about you know fancy. Every time I try to get fancy... Did they give this to you or did they get a free side there? I hope they gave it. No, this. no, no. That, <laughs> Zoom, that one's on me. Next time... <laughs> Call me. Uh, the and you said once you get fancy, fancy gets broken. That's right. right. And it's just such a nice mantra, I think, to keep in mind, and that could really help someone. What did, what warnings or advice would you give to aspiring? documentary. Well, I mean, filmmakers. I think the biggest thing is we, we try to overcomplicate things when you start making movies or even TV shows, whatever it is. Like you, you have these grandiose ideas of everything that you need and everything that has to, has to be done. And especially today, like the YouTubeification of content creation and content consumption has shifted our, our concept of what, what it means to make something good or palatable. Um, we are infinitely more forgiving of stuff that looks dodgy for good story. You can sacrifice quality for great story. So for me, it's like, it's all about the story. It doesn't matter. Like I'll watch shaky camera footage. Now I'll watch somebody's like shitty thing on their phone. So long as it's a great story it, you know, and, and I'm engaged because we've gotten to the point now where we are past that. We're forgiving yeah. of all that. It's true of audio too. Yeah, it's true of audio. Like you'll, you'll, so long as I can hear it and it's not just <laughs> the whole time, I will, I will be, I will still be forgiving of it. Um, and I think that's what I tell, I tell young filmmakers all the time is story first. It's all about the story. It's like everything else about what you want it to be or how long you want it to be. It should be as long as it needs to be ultimately, but it's all about the story. And if you've gotten a beginning and middle and an end and you've told your core in 40 minutes or 60 minutes, then don't stretch it out because now you're just putting, you're just, you're dressing up something that doesn't need it. If you wanted to give people examples or resources for masterful storytelling, yeah. are there any particular books, films, resources? I mean, for me, the best the best resources are the movies themselves. Like, I mean, I am such a I am such a, a movie freak. Um, for nonfiction movies, like if you're watching nonfiction films, like my favorite nonfiction film of all time, which kind of pushed me to seeing documentaries excuse me, seeing documentaries as like a viable outlet for my creativity as I got older was, it was when I was in college, I saw the Joe Berlinger and Bruce Sanofsky film, Brothers Keeper. Brothers Keeper. Brothers Keeper, which is one of the greatest films you've ever watched. This is like, see, this is New York City, as you guys can hear. This is what happens in New York. We get a train going by. You can hear everything rumbling in yeah, the office. Sounds like an earthquake. There's an earthquake. <laughs> like all the glass is shaking. It'll stop in a second. <laughs> this is this is New York. Um, 
The, so it's a film called Brothers Keeper, and I saw it in a movie theater because uh, I heard everybody talking about it, and I was like, I have to go see this film. And it was the first time I think I probably ever paid to see a movie, a documentary in a movie theater. And because um, I, I was in film school, so we were watching a lot of docs in school, but never, but never in a actually where I bought a ticket. And so I bought a ticket, went to see this film, and the film is so good. It's so dark and it's so creepy, and it's about these three brothers where one of them is accused. It's in upstate New York, so it's like these three country brothers where one of them is accused of murdering another one and as it goes on in the trial of this guy being brought up for on murder charges that there was like there was like incest and it's like i mean it gets dark and weird and so good but that's one of those films where that that there's there were so many levels of emotion you feel when you're watching that and it was so beautifully shot and when a years later when i got to meet joe and bruce i just i mean i gushed over them like this movie i was like that movie changed my life like it is one of the greatest movies i've ever seen in my life and I, to this day i mean i'm still such a fan like when i see people i'm a little fanboy when i see somebody that i look up to it's like i, I will go over and just like and just like cover them with fangirlness yeah <laughs> <laughs> Who else falls in that? I mean, Errol Morris is a genius. Like, what was that? Errol Morris. Errol Morris. Errol Morris, who is like that guy. His the amazing. Here's the thing about if you if you go to Errol Morris's website, Errol Morris is such a craftsman. Could you describe who he is? I apologize. I'm so Errol totally Morris blanking. is the Errol Morris did the Fog of War. Uh, Errol which Morris I still haven't seen. Errol Morris did the Thin Blue Line. Like years ago, Errol Morris was one of the guys who started putting like real dramatic produced recreations in movies. Like when he did Thin Blue Line, people attacked the film. And this is crazy to think about. Back when he made this in whatever, 80 something, they're like, this isn't a documentary. It's like you got, you got, you got fake, you got actors in there doing things. You got stuff that you staged. You staged things in a movie. That's not a documentary. And when you look at that, like the movie is gorgeous, but it, but it set the tone. And it's like, it basically changed what we think of what a documentary could be. And so, um, you know, the same thing happened years later. I remember when I was on a panel with Al Mazels, and Al Mazels, this was like right when Super Size Me came out, and Al Mazels told me, um, he goes, he goes, yeah, what you do, that he goes, what you do isn't documentary. He goes, you don't, he goes, well, you don't make documentaries. And I, and, and again, it was like there was a transformational moment um, of I think what people's interpretation of what a doc could be was. Why did he say that? Because he saw it being like from a first person standpoint, he didn't see like me telling a first person story as being a documentary. Huh. Um, same thing. He didn't think Michael Moore made documentaries. Um, and so he's, so that was, so that was kind of his idea, but like Errol Morris, you know, back to this amazing craftsman, like his stuff is so beautiful. And if you go to his website, like how Errol Morris, like really pays the bills is he makes commercials. Um, cause it's not, it's not like we're going out and buying boats, making documentaries. Hey, let's right. be honest. Like we don't have like a fleet of Ferraris outside. It's like you, you make these movies because you believe in them and what they represent. But if you go to his website, it's like, if I, and I think it's Errol Morris.com. I'm not sure if you go there, it's like, it has like all these commercials that he's made and just experiments that he does with the cameras, which is awesome. Like, and you see like how he, he will take somebody's crazy commercial money and do something he's never done. And then once he tries that, he starts to apply those tricks and, and, pri- and transplant it to his movies. That's and it's cool. It's so cool to see, but That's it's really- like cool. he's a he's a talent. Like I have mad respect for him. And then there's somebody like Steve James, who I think Steve James is just a great storyteller. Steve James did Hoop Dreams. He did Stevie. He did Life Itself. Um, a, apart from Steve James just being an epic human being, like he's a magnificent human. Like I say all the time, like when I grow up, I want to be Steve James because he's a he's just a great individual who treats people well you know, is, is, you know, will return anybody's phone call, talks to anyone is the last guy to leave when students are asking him questions. You know, I, 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 I really admired that. And so there's, there's p- things like that, that I take from people, but, but he's also a great filmmaker. You know, he really believes in what he does. And so I think when you look at his films and he's one of those guys who makes movies over years, you know, like he'll make a movie for like five, seven, eight years. And, and that type of dedication, I really, I really look up to. That's a huge commitment. That's right. And on the, on the point of films, so if, do, do you still, why still make films? And the reason I ask is that yeah. when we're talking about formats and say the future of media, I, I think about this quite a lot. <clears throat> there are people who say can create very, very popular blogs yeah. and then get courted by the big publishers in New York City and publish books. Sure. And the book still to this day, for whatever reason, occupies a unique part of mind space in human beings. It yeah. just carries a level of gravitas that yeah. is not associated with the internet, right? Quite wrongly, I think. Yeah. But people can become sort of part of the cultural zeitgeist and have a real impact with books in a way that is very difficult with something that is viewed as ephemeral online. Yes. Do documentaries still have that it, and maybe it's just something I perceive, but that yeah. difference compared to say TV or is that 
Uh, well, am I, think, I making that up? No, I mean, I think that what's happened though now is there's been a couple things that have happened. One, on the heels of like HBO and Netflix and Showtime, and especially Netflix, where more people I think have seen things I've made on Netflix than anywhere else, which is fantastic. I think that they have created a larger audience for documentaries than ever before. And I think that type of hunger is what's also starting to drive this push into smarter nonfiction television, um, both from a Netflix standpoint and from a television standpoint. Because what happened in television is there were all of these people – all these networks. And it started with like FX. So first, first it was HBO who raised the bar for scripted television and started making scripted television beyond what any of us thought was possible for TV. I mean, they just started crushing it. And so then other people said, well, we should be creating that level of television. That's I mean, when I was working with FX back in the day, John Landgraf, brilliant guy, one of the smartest TV people you'll ever meet in your life. Um, said this, that's what we like. We want to be HBO for, for commercial television. And that's what he created. Like he was the champion that made that and raised that bar for FX. And then, you know, then Showtime did. And now if you look across the spectrum of TV, every network has at least one amazing show. Like USA has Mr. Robot, which is spectacular. Like every, you go down the line, everybody's got one big, big fiction show, but nobody had smart nonfiction. Everybody kind of left that down here. It was lowest common denominator. So while the rising tide lifted all the ships for fiction, it didn't happen for nonfiction. And now people are realizing as, as they're abandoning ship with these, all these crappy TV shows that we're missing the boat. There's higher expectations from our audience. And now they're starting to push that, you know, as HBO did with the jinx. And again, HBO leading the charge of let's jinx was great. It was fantastic. They said, let's show people that you can make smarter nonfiction. Talk about dark, dark, so dark. And so then there was that there was making a murderer on Netflix. And now everybody's like, Oh, people want to see smart nonfiction. We should be doing that. Um, which is great for us. It's great for people like Alex Gibney. Um, Who's that? Alex Gibney, who did smartest Enron, smartest guys in the room. Oh, yeah, he did the Scientology movie. Going he's clear, going clear. Oh God, yeah. another creepy one. Alex, he's he's a great person That's, you should talk to yeah. on the podcast. He's yeah. an amazing filmmaker. And again, somebody I really look up to because I think he's he's incredibly cerebral, very yeah. smart. That was, a, I mean, the amount of data crunching and just review, yeah, required to make going clear was so evident Incredible. in the making of the film. Incredible. And he's, he is a deep researcher and I really, I, I think he's fantastic, but, uh, but it's one of those things that for people like us who've been kind of living in the space and making this type of content for a long time, it's fantastic because now it just opens up and broadens the spectrum. So for me, I feel like there's still a place to make movies and, and then there's now there's a, now there's more places to make smarter TV, which I think is really exciting. What do you think you will be, if you had to speculate, what do you, th- what, what do you think you'll be creating in five or ten, three, five or ten years, whichever I mean, you want to choose? We're we're about to start doing some really awesome VR projects. Like that'll be this year. We're going to be doing some incredible stuff. We've 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 held back. For, I didn't want to kind of jump in early, um, as everybody else is kind of jumping on this VR bandwagon. And we've been we've been smart about what we've been navigating through and the projects that we want to make. And so that's that's going to be something that's going to be real. And and I think that VR has the ability to become an empathy machine. I think it has the ability to put you in places and experience things and feelings in a way you never have before. Um, so that's like, super exciting for me as somebody who, you know, believes that you can actually, you know, start to chip away and make the world a better place with entertainment. You know, I think movies and TV shows have a profound impact on our belief system. And I think that uh, there's just something we can do there. So for me, I think that's that's where we'll be. I think we'll be doing I mean, it's in five years probably won't be exactly five, maybe closer to 10, but it, there's going to be one pipe that delivers everything. There's going to be one pipe where I watch everything, whether it's on my TV at home, um, on my, on my tablet, on my phone, it'll be everywhere. It's gonna be one pipe that feeds everything. And that's going to be an exciting time for a couple of reasons, because now anything I want to see is suddenly going to be right at my fingertips, wherever, whenever, wherever I'll be able to watch anything. Awesome. But simultaneously, you're going to be to the point of still back to the YouTubeification of our viewing habits where, how do you now, how do you now bring eyeballs? How do you let people know it's there? And I think that's the next step. You know, there were three stages of, of real shifts in entertainment that I think were big. And one the first one really helped me because it made super size me possible. And there was like this democratization of, of production, democratization of cinema, where suddenly anyone with a camera and a computer and a good idea could make a movie. That was huge. So now suddenly everybody had access to the tools. Um, you could put in the sweat equity. You could make something really cheaply and easily get it out for the world to see. Next was kind of this democratization of distribution where now I didn't need to have, you know, Sony or, or, or Paramount put out a movie um, in a movie theater. I could put it online. Now anybody in the world could have access to my content, you know, via YouTube or via Vimeo. But now how do you get people to see it? That's the problem. So it's out there, but it's invisible. Now comes the next big step, which will be huge as the pipelines converge, which is almost like this democratization of curation, this democratization of marketing. 
how do now we point people towards what matters? And that's where it's going to be influencers. It's going to be people like you. It's going to be uh, people like me who people trust. And those voices are going to be even more resonant as we move forward because people are going to trust in them even uh, with even more, I think, importance. Here, here. Yeah, I agree. I, I was a VR skeptic until I had a demo with the HTC Vive with running Valve software yeah. in Seattle where I was fully kitted out and in maybe a 20 by 20 foot space and uh, where you can walk around you can and walk the walls around. come up. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. And what just, what struck me as someone who for long, long time listeners of this podcast know may I may or may not have dabbled in various types of plant medicine or other <laughs> molecules, the time distortion yeah. that I experienced in that immersive VR, which is still model T by comparison totally. looking towards say what's going to exist three years from now yeah i thought i was in for five or six no no i thought i was in for five or six minutes and i was in for almost 25 minutes wow and i that's when i was like okay there is something really fundamental going on yeah and you said this empathy machine i mean just like the simulacrum and uh the ability to elicit emotion is so far beyond yeah. anything coming from a flat screen that's right it was just mind blowing. Yeah, no, I was just at I was just at Google this past week and meeting with their VR guys and seeing some of the stuff they're working on. And, and you, it's like you're in the Matrix. Like suddenly, it's like it's the closest thing I could imagine to suddenly being Neo and taking the pill and being thrust into the machine that 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 I could. And it's I mean, what's coming is incredibly exciting. Yeah, and it just as and as a and as a content creator and as a storyteller, it just makes you realize we've barely begun to scratch the surface of what's possible. Like it is, as you said, it's a model T like it is so early and it's, that excites me. Like we've always been a very early adopter of technology. I, you know, we've always been, we've always tried to be a little ahead of the curve and, and what we use, the tools we use to tell stories. And so for me, I think this is going to be incredible. Which filmmakers out there do you feel are pushing the envelope in terms of technology uh, or innovations in the space, because I know, I mean, for instance, like James Cameron. James Cameron's phenomenal. I mean, James yeah. Cameron, I think, invented the camera that he used on the last movie. Like it was him and his partner created the Pace Cameron camera to use on Avatar. Like they changed the whole box that, that made that movie. It's bonkers. He, he invented the technology that created like the 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 what was it like the Chrome the Chrome cop in Terminator Two? Because nobody, everybody's like, we can't do this, and he's like, I'll fund it myself. And what's what's so cool about so that? We created Lightstorm to basically yeah. do that technology. Which correct me if I'm wrong, because you would be the person to correct me. Yeah. That the Abyss, which I enjoyed, but was not, I understand, a commercial success, is where he honed that technology that later enabled him to to create that use it in Terminator 2 that's exactly right which that's is exactly. such an awesome story and it was out of that yeah because it was so. out of that where he that's where he got the idea of what could happen with this other character and what it could be and he poured all his own money into making that a reality which I love I mean I'm somebody who fly I mean I'm a real believer that you should always bet on yourself first and pre when we made Super Size Me I remember I was uh because this was right when we sold our show to MTV, the first show we created online, when you know from the interactive consortium when we had that company. <laughs> the con. So here's the con. So when we created the first show we created under the con was a show called I Bet You Will. And so we sold that show to CBS and then to MTV and then 9-11 happened. So we had proof of concept. We proved that we create, could create programming online and springboard it off. So we created the first show to really go from the web to television as a series, sold it to MTV, then 9-11 happened. Everything stopped. Like production just came to a standstill in New York City. So we had no money. Um, I was evicted from my apartment. I was sleeping in a hammock in my office. That was, so that, so every morning I would get up and go to the gym around the corner, the New York sports club to like shower and work out. I was in great shape because it says I didn't have a choice. Um, and then I would come back to my office. And we had, I still had people coming to work and to make sure that they could pay their rent and, and pay their bills. I took out credit cards. And so I was basically paying their rent with credit cards. I was paying their bills with credit cards. I was Oof. paying credit cards with credit cards. And I amassed about a quarter of a million dollars in credit card debt um, in, in about a year. Wow. Yeah. And so, but I still had an office and I still yeah. had a business. And I was like, I'm not, I'm, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still betting on us. And so that's when MTV greenlit the series and we did 53 episodes of that show. And during that time, I paid off like fifty thousand dollars worth of that debt. And then when they canceled it, I had another fifty grand in the bank. And I was like, "Well, I could either pour this fifty thousand dollars into that bottomless pit of debt, or we could make a movie." 
because we owned all the equipment. Again, it was the same thing. We had the cameras, we had the computers. Let's make a film, and that film was supersized me, and it changed everything. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, so I, so that's why, I mean, like, James Cameron is one of those people that I, I really look at and admire because he will always bet on him, and he'll always bet on his ability. If you haven't read the New Yorker article about James Cameron when he was making um, when he was making Avatar, not only is he a genius, but he also is a bit of a bully and says, like, some terrible things to people who work for him. Like, there's, there's some of the greatest lines that you'll ever hear him say to human beings which there's a guy who's like rigging lights um and he says to the guy and he goes watching you lights like watching a monkey fuck a football <laughs> and he yells to another guy he's like hiring you was like firing two good men and it's like some of the oh, lines, ouch some of the lines are phenomenal it's like i really and i worked with but here's the thing but it's like i mean part of me is he may be saying this and i worked with a guy years ago um a guy named gene licht who ran a printing shop back when i was in college and I worked for I worked for Gene through a friend of mine at NYU um, who worked there, ran the print shop. And so I would go to this print shop and Gene was one of those guys who would basically yell and scream at the top of his lungs and say terrible, insulting things that I thought I thought it was spectacularly funny <laughs> and really entertaining. And um, and so for me, and, but I also think he did it in jest to be funny, even though he was mean about it. But he was also saying it in jest to also make other people laugh, which I feel like James Cameron's doing the same thing. But it's uh, so Gene, you know, rest in peace. He was he was a phenomenal guy. <laughs> James, uh, this is a quick side note. I remember. Has he done the podcast? He hasn't. I would oh, love to do it with him. I've met him once. I went on yeah. a uh, zero gravity, like a zero G flight. Yep. Where the the like the payload was ridiculous. I mean, if uh, we're really fortunate, the plane didn't go down because it was like Elon Musk, James Cameron. Like you go down the list, it was nuts. Amazing. And uh, I had a chance to get some swag, avatar swag because it was uh it was a I, I, obviously I paid for the flight yeah. and brought a reader along actually who won some type of competition I'd thrown and we all got t-shirts that had been given to the staff uh and the crew working on avatar and yeah. the shirt was great the shirt said and I might be getting this slightly wrong, but it was in huge font right across the check and it's uh, a chest. It said, hope is not a strategy. Luck is not a factor. Failure is not an option. Hyphen James Cameron. <laughs> and I was like, wow, it's like setting the tone, <laughs> setting the tone for production. And uh, I wore that shirt when I was writing the four hour body, which like just about killed me literally and kind of figuratively. Yeah. But one experience. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's like, I, is there anybody, you know, who is that exacting and forward thinking who isn't brutal in some respect? I mean, it's, I think, no, because part of me, it feels like you have to be so steadfast in your belief. You have to, because if you don't drink the Kool-Aid, nobody drinks the Kool-Aid. Um, I mean, it's got to be, who's the other person that's probably in that, in that same type of state, like Kanye, is Kanye there? And I mean, Kanye's probably on even a different level of, than like James Cameron, but, but comparable, I think, in kind of maybe a mega, mega maniacal way. Um, but I think that, uh, I think you have to, you have to believe in you first. Torre, um, the, who's the, he's a great writer, um, commentator, uh, was, he told me the story where he went to Kanye's house once. And so he's in Kanye's house and inside Kanye's house, there's a big giant poster of Kanye, <laughs> like right inside the living room. And so, and so Torre said to him, he goes, um, he goes, Kanye, why do you have a giant picture of you on the wall? And he goes, well, I got to cheer for me before anyone else can cheer for me. And I was like, there's some fantastic logic in that. That's actually there's a good some, response. There's some good logic in I there. I don't know if I can yeah. stomach the grief I would get for putting a huge, like, Tim <laughs> Ferriss. <laughs> poster to yourself. Yeah, like yeah. Burt Reynolds centerfold. Kind of, I don't know if you've ever seen White Chicks. There's yeah. this one. Yeah, you know, Terry right. Crews. I don't know if my friends will let me get away with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, as, as you come into my office and there's, like, there's like posters of the films that, like, I've made in the wall. So it's like, there's, those are my, that's my, I guess, my Kanye moment. Got to cheer for yourself first. That's right. Uh I know we only have a few more minutes. Sure. Uh, so just a couple more questions, and then hopefully we'll do a round two sometime. But the uh, I'm not going to go through all my usual rapid fire questions. But one I would love to ask is, yeah. what is the book that you've gifted most to other people? Oh, um, I tell you what, there was a I gave the Bhagavad Gita to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, this was right after, I guess, it would have been right after my son was born. And then right after I got divorced, somebody gave it to me and, and I got a lot out of it. And again, it's, there's been multiple, multiple interpretations, multiple writings of it. Um, um, but, uh, 
there was one in particular interpretation. I can't remember who the writer was, um, or the guy who, who basically did this, this translation, but I gave that book to, I don't know, a couple dozen people who they're like, yeah, I'm just like, I'm just having, I'm having a hard time right now. I don't know what to do. And I was like, you should read this book. This yeah. is one of these books that has come up so many times in my life that I have not yet read. So yeah. this might be the final. I'm going I'm to send you. I'm going to send you the translation <laughs> that I read. Cool. Yeah, I appreciate done. it. It's it's kind of like the Tao Te Ching. It's like I put it off for. I didn't put it off. I just never took the step to read it for yeah. decades and decades. Cool. This is good. This is a nudge that I need. And uh, we talked about technology earlier. You have a lot of irons in the fire. Yeah. Would you like to tell people about what you're up to in in the uh, tech space? Um, yeah, so we, uh, this is, this is a great thing. I was just out at Jason Calacanis's launch in, uh, San Francisco yeah, where big event. we had a, we had a company that had been in his incubator slash accelerator for the last four months called collect. And this is a, a company you can go to, you can go to collect.com or you can download the apps in the iTunes store, but it's a, it's a, a company that spelled is spelled as you would expect C L E C T. Yeah. It. Yeah. So it's a, the whole genesis of this and what it is, it's basically like a, a geek collectible marketplace. So anything that is geek, anything that you would imagine at Comic-Con that you love from, you know, Walking Dead to whatever, you know, posters to action figures, whatever you, the, those geeky things you love, vinyl, like I collect a lot of, a lot of like, uh, um, like vinyl characters, caricatures made by, um, pop artists. So anything, um, no matter what it is, is you can like find it on collect. And so I was being chased by, I was finishing a movie in London and the founder of the company, this guy, Steve Brumwell was chasing me, chasing me, chasing me. And he finally said, uh, and I said, what is it? And he goes, you're the only person that's going to get this. Like you'll understand. And a couple years ago, I made a movie with Stan Lee and Joss Whedon about Comic-Con. And then two years before that, I made the Simpsons 20th anniversary special for Fox. Like, so I'm a, I'm like a geek to core into my core. Um, and so I said, what is it? Show it to me. So he showed me just like a flip deck of what it was. And I was like, I love this. And so we sat down, we talked about the company. I came on board as one of the, one of the founders early on, um, put money into the company. And it's one of those where I just, I believe in this, like of the, what is it? I think it's $18 billion a year that's spent on eBay. A third of that 6 billion is everything that lives within this geek space. So I think there's a great place to give people a better experience where you can actually have a geek to geek experience. So there's a, there's kind of a great social atmosphere to it. Um, but then there's also the ability to buy, to sell, to trade with fellow geeks and, and, you know, feel like you're actually getting something you love. So is that's, there, that's awesome. Do you have any particular favorite categories or items that you've seen on the site? Oh my gosh, there's so much fan art. Like there's so much stuff that people create on their own, which is awesome. And so I love seeing the stuff that people draw on their own posters. They create, uh, it's, it's, it's spectacular. So for me, I love seeing things like that. Um, I love the people who have stuff that's still in the original packaging that's been on their shelves since like 19. So people who have like original Star Wars toys from like when you and I were kids. It's still in original packaging. Yeah. And like that's that is dedication. It's a lot of dedication. That's, that's a lot, a lot of self control too. Exactly. I mean, when I was a little kid, I still have all my old star, like original Star Wars toys. Yeah. But like the heads are gnawed on. Oh the, yeah. The, the hands always got chewed off because I was yeah. a little animal. Yeah. Like I still have like I have my original Darth Vader carry case that's in my kid's room with, that I wouldn't let him play with for years until like last year when I knew he. <laughs> wouldn't totally like junk all the toys. So now he can actually play with the action figures. <laughs> so collect C L E C T dot com. Correct. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, we just went through, we just went through like our, our kind of seed round. It's, it's, it's exciting. It's a cool thing. And it's, it's like, I love having had my first startup, you know, which I started, you know, what was that 16 years ago and was going around and doing all the angel meetings back then. I mean, for me, it was exciting to kind of be back in that space. And it is, it is a very similar hustle to raising money for movies. Um, you're just talking to, I think a lot smarter people, like when the people that live and breathe in that space or people are. who or people who pretend to be a lot smarter that's right that's true that's true you meet, you meet a lot of them as well yeah uh okay last last question before we we wrap for this this round one is if you could put a billboard anywhere with anything on it <laughs> not an advertisement necessarily for anything you're doing what would you put on it um oh i feel like right now it has to it would have to be uh have to be something Trump related right now. I just I would I would have to have something with like his with his tiny little hands and remind people like what that means when he gets to the White House. Do you want these little hands on the button? I feel like I want people to it. <laughs> Do you want these puckered lips yelling at foreign dignitaries? Do you want these little hands on the button? That's right. Oh please God! Yes, uh, it's, it's 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 becoming for reals right now. It's, it's like it's terrifying. A, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I'm in yeah. I'm in awe. 
<laughs> I'm speechless. Yeah. I'm absolutely yeah. speechless. I feel like I feel like it's I, it is it takes a lot to make Morgan Spurlock speechless. I, but I feel like I'm in the middle of a reality show. You're watching. It's like how is this actually happening? I don't yeah. understand how this is happening. Yeah. Oh, good golly, Miss Molly. Yes, yeah. it is. Uh, th- these are these are scary, desperate, and surreal times that we live in. Completely. Uh, where can people find you online? Learn more about you. Say yeah, hello on social. Yeah, on on Facebook on which is just you know me. It's Morgan Spurlock. Then on on Twitter at Morgan Spurlock. Uh, Instagram's at Morgan Spurlock NYC. Um, Snapchat, you'll be able to track me down. I'm all over. I'm all over the all over the social media. All over the interwebs. The interwebs. Which do you tend to? What is your primary? What do you? If I'm on Twitter all the time because yeah. Twitter has become my news feed. Like Twitter is my AP. Exactly. Like I'm on Twitter all day long, and it's just constant updates. I and, use it in the same way. Yeah, and I love that. It's like it is a constant news source. Um, where I'll check into other newspapers along the day, like, you know, I'll check in with the times and, or like, you know, talking points memo or, or the New York post or whatever, cause the New York post is spectacular and you have to. Um, but I feel, but, but it, but like the Twitter I'm, I'm on, I'm on the, on Twitter all day long, five, at, like eight, at, nine, 12 times at Morgan Spurlock at Morgan Spurlock. And, uh, I'll give you just since we're talking about tech, one tip that I found really useful, which is a service yeah. called Nuzzle, N-U-Z-Z-E-L, yeah. uh, made by a friend of mine, which uh, effectively looks for patterns among the people you follow. And it will take, say, the top five stories yeah. that are being spread and pushed out by the people you already follow That's awesome. and create a digest for you. That's smart. So it's a really, really cool service that so I'm surprised saying, Twitter didn't make itself. So you're saying I should stop following Kim Kardashian if I'm going to sign up for <laughs> Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on who else you're following, I That's guess. Right. You might want to stop following all of the Kardashians. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, well, this is great fun. This has been uh, awesome. really fun to hang out and uh, to be continued. And to everybody listening, of course, show notes, links to everything that we discussed, you'll be able to find at fourhourworkweek.com forward slash podcast. And Morgan, thanks so much for taking the time. Great to see you, man. Thank you. All right. Until next time. Thanks, guys. Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? Would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, and just drop in your email and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by 99designs. When your business needs a logo, website, business card, thumbnail, or any other design, I recommend checking out 99designs. I use them myself. I've used them for many years. I use them to create book cover prototypes for the four hour body, which went on to become a number one New York Times bestseller. I've also used them for banner ads, illustrations, and much more. With 99designs, you get a variety of original designs from designers around the world. Give your feedback and then pick your favorite. Your happiness is guaranteed. So check out some of my competitions and designs and some of your competitions and designs from fellow Tim Ferriss show listeners at 99designs.com forward slash Tim. And right now you can get a free $99 upgrade on your first design. So check it out. 99designs.com forward slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront, and this is a very unique sponsor. Wealthfront is a massively disruptive, in a good way, set it and forget it investing service led by technologists from places like Apple and world famous investors. It has exploded in popularity in the last two years, and they now have more than two and a half billion dollars under management. In fact, some of my very good friends, investors in Silicon Valley have millions of their own money in Wealthfront. So the question is why? Why is it so popular? Why is it unique? Because you can get services previously reserved for the ultra wealthy, but only pay pennies on the dollar for them. And this is because they use smarter software instead of retail locations, bloated sales teams, etc. And I'll come back to that in a second. I suggest you check out wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. 
take the risk assessment quiz, which only takes two to five minutes, and they'll show you for free exactly the portfolio they put you in. And if you just want to take their advice, run with it, do it yourself, you can do that. Or as I would, you can set it and forget it. And here's why. The value of Wealthfront is in the automation of habits and strategies that investors should be using on a regular basis, but normally aren't. Great investing is a marathon, not a sprint, and little things that you may or may not be familiar with, like automatic tax loss harvesting, rebalancing your portfolio across more than 10 asset classes, and dividend reinvestment add up to very large amounts of money over longer periods of time. Wealthfront, as I mentioned, since it's using software instead of retail locations, etc., can offer all of this at low costs that were previously completely impossible. Right off the bat, you never pay commissions or account fees. For everything, they charge 0.25% per year on assets above the first 15000 which is managed for free if you use my link, wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. That is less than $5 a month to invest a $30,000 account, for instance. Now, normally, when I have a sponsor on this show, it's because I use them and recommend them. In this case, it's a little different. I don't use Wealthfront yet because I'm not allowed to. Here's the deal. They wanted to sponsor this podcast, but because of SEC regulations, companies that invest your money are not allowed to use client testimonials. So I couldn't be a user and have them on the podcast. But I've been so impressed by Wealthfront that I've invested a significant amount of my own money, at least for me, uh, in the team and the company itself. So I am an investor and hope to soon use it as a client. Now back to the recommendation. As a Tim Ferriss Show listener, you'll get $15,000 managed for free if you decide to open an account. But just start with seeing the portfolio that they would suggest for you. Take two minutes, fill out their questionnaire at wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. It's fast. It's free. There's no downside that I can think of. Just take a look, see what portfolio they would create for you, and you can use that information however you want. Wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. And until next time, thank you for listening. 